Hey guys, it's James here for jamestf.com and in today's tutorial we're going to be going over two methods in which you can level up your control of lights in Cinema 4D and Redshift. Now the first method is incredibly simple, I reckon it's going to take us all of about five seconds to master, but the second method is a bit more in-depth and is going to give us some crazy control over all of the parameters of a light in Redshift. Now this is applicable to other render engines as well, you'll just have to take what you learn here and apply it to your render engine of choice, whether that's Arnold or Octane or something else entirely. So we're going to be going over a bit of Espresso, we're going to be driving some fields and we're going to be making some pretty cool effects. So let's dive into Cinema 4D and see how it's done. Okay, here we are almost in Cinema 4D. So this is the render with the lighting that we are trying to replicate. So we're going to be focusing on the top part of this image where I've drawn the circle and this arrow. That was a pretty good arrow. Uh, we're going to be looking at this kind of central uh, part, which is bright white going down into this kind of orangey kind of color. Now, what you may have noticed with this image is the intensity of the light in the center also starts to scale off as the color does towards the outskirts here. So as I mentioned, we're going to be going over two methods. The first method can't really adjust the intensity of the lights, but it can mess with the color. The second method can do everything. So what we'll do is quickly go over the first method and then dive into method two. So let's jump into Cinema 4D. So this is the scene file for the render that you just saw. As you can see, we've got a cloner here with a load of lights inside of it. Each one has got an espresso tag, and then we've got this spherical field here, which as you can see in the rendered uh, image over on the left hand side, you can see the temperature effect and the intensity effect of the lightning uh, matches where this spherical field is. So this is what's driving the effect of everything. So let's jump into a new scene and get building. Okay, so in this new scene, all I've done is switch the rendering mode from standard over to redshift. I've created an area light just by clicking here and clicking area lights. Made a cloner by clicking here. And I've just made a floor by creating a plane and dragging it below everything that we've built. So a few things I've changed in the area light. I've changed the intensity to 1, I've changed the X and Y scale to 30 and just checked on visible and bi-directional and all that means is when we render to the viewport, not the view, viewport, the uh, render view, uh, we can see the lights show up and then we've got the, the floor plane obviously just to show where the light is getting cast as well. So for method 1 what we're going to do is create a plane and we're going to create a spherical field, make it a child of the plane and just make sure in this fields tab that our spherical field is there. Under our cloner, we're going to go over to effectors and drag in our plane effector and everything's going to go a bit crazy. That's because we've got position checked on. We'll turn that off and we'll make sure color mode is set to fields color because we're going to be messing with color. So in this fields color, if we go to color remap, we can see this this kind of mint green color might be different for you. But if we zoom in on our cloner and look at these little dots that are in the middle of each cloned light, you can actually see that they have changed color. Let's make it a, a topical hot Barbie pink so we can see it a bit more clearly. And now we can see these lights have actually changed from pink and are fading out into white, which is the sort of thing we're looking for, just the wrong color. Um, although what we're not looking for is everything just being white as it is over on the left. So in order to fix this, we're just going to grab our lights and click blend object color. When we check that, boom, there we go. Everything's getting a bit more Barbie up in here now. Let's make this a bit bigger. Now we're talking that a little bit smaller and we're starting to get quite a nice fall off from pink to white. What you may have noticed though and this will become a little clearer once we start ramping up the intensity. Let's just make this a little more Barbie-ish. There we go. Uh, so if we come into this light and now start ramping up the intensity to like maybe not 50 but 5 for example this deep purple that we had when the intensity was 1 pink, sorry, not purple, um, 
is now getting completely washed out and we can't really see uh, the, the true color of these lights. And it looks great on the white, it's kind of blasted it out into this hot white color, but the, uh, the desired effect from having this kind of deep purple is not working. So that is the quick and dirty method one. Actually, you know what we'll do? We'll try and recreate the temperature color as well. So let's go over to our spherical field. Um, let's, sorry Barbie, we'll make this kind of a deep red kind of color, something like that. We'll go to our remapping and invert it. Uh, perhaps we'll change this contour mode to curve. So that's a bit of a nicer fall off. We'll reduce that. Maybe we go back into the color, make this a bit more orange. And it's kind of close, but as we know, if we start changing this value, say we want the middle bit to be brighter, then it's going to start blasting out all of the other colors and does not look too great. So that's method one. It's got some uses for sure. If you just need color and you're happy with your light being stuck at one for intensity, then by all means use this. But I think once we get into method number two, you'll see the true power of, uh, of Espresso and Redshift lights. Okay, so we're now back where we started, ready for method two. So method two uses Espresso. So let's start by right clicking on our light, going to programming tags and creating an Espresso tag. So this will open up the Espresso window and in here we can drag in lots of different objects and do things with them. So the first thing we're gonna do is drag in a light as we are gonna be needing one of those. We're gonna create a spherical field as we're gonna be needing one of those too. And then we're going to create a fall off node and a result node. Now with these objects, we'll basically be able to create everything that we need. So inside this light here, I'm just going to click, left click on the uh, red box in the corner here, go into coordinates, global position and global position. And then, then going to connect that to the sample position. So what this does is this fall off is looking for a sample position that the fall off will be enacted upon. So at the moment, we just want one of our lights to be the sample position. In the fall off, we're then going to cl click on fall off matrix. We're going to go to global matrix on our spherical field, and we're going to connect the two there. What this will do is basically use the fall off that we're seeing here for the spherical field and apply that to our fall off here. The other important thing that we need to remember to do is inside our fall off node, we're just going to drop in spherical field into here and everything should be connected. What we'll also do is just collect, connect the value to a result node. And as we can see here, we're just outputting the number zero. So let's start moving this, make it a bit bigger and see if we can get it to see something. Nothing yet. Over here, down here. Ah, so look, now we've got a value of 0 0.304. So what's happened here is our lights are cloned from position zero. So position zero is our sample position. And this position that the fall off node is in, if we look at it from above, is basically 0.3 of the way from the outer to the inner area of the fall off. So it's basically mapped this to 0 0.34 or 304. Now what we can do is take this number and turn that into another number using a range mapper. So let's create one of those nodes. But before we connect this all up, we're going to have to find a way to access all of these clones instead of just one. Because if we play the render view here and connect our light, so let's connect our light. So we'll hold control, click and drag, then let go. And then on this value node, if I just open that up, input that into our light, go to object, and then this is the difficulty with redshift lights is all of the parameters for every light is stored within this drop down box here. So when you change it to spotlight, this intensity value is actually different. So we need to find the one that is for uh, an area light. So object, I think it's the third one. Um, let's 
try it intensity yeah so you can see that that's now connected up and we've got stuff happening so that's good news if you move this over this way it should get brighter and that way everything should get dim cool so that's working but as we know this is now affecting all of the lights at once so let's pause this duplicate our light cloner turn off the original and turn off the light and then we're going to hit C on the keyboard under this new cloner and it's going to create a copy of every single one of our lights. So now we can go into the original cloner, delete the original light, select all of our new lights and drop them into the cloner. Now we can turn that back on and we're still going to get that index value by putting them in the cloner on top of each light and that's going to correspond to the number at the end of each of our lights as you can see. So now we can start linking this to everything, all of the other clones that are inside this cloner. So let's delete all but one of the Expresso tags. And the light we're going to focus on is like 110 right in the middle there. So grab this tag, we'll just drag all the way up till we get to 110. There it is, drop it on there and we can open this node again. Now, the keen-eyed among you will have realized that we're still on light 220 in this object operator node. That is because reference mode is set to absolute reference. So that means wherever we put this tag, it's always going to refer to light 220. If we, as we've told it, this is the absolute reference. So let's drag it back to 210 and change this value from absolute to relative. And this path is going to be filled with figures, delete that, and now it's going to update to wherever we position this tag. So now it's 111, 112, and so on. So let's go back to 110. We also need to do this for the lights at the end of the chain. So change that to relative, delete all of those, and we're back to where we started. Right. Next step is we need to change the values with this range mapper so we can get temperature applied to all of these lights because at the moment we're in color mode so let's just select all of these lights and just change it to temperature now if we hit play we should see some red and there we go and we can see the fall off is working as well so we know we're on to the right track now temperature node basically the lower this value the more red lights will become and the higher this value the more white lights will become so let's just hit play um, and let's set this to a value like 500 and we can see that probably 1000 maybe 1200 so there's a bit more orange in there and then if we start gradually dragging this up you can see we start to go to white and then you can go all the way to blue if you go up to huge values so i think our maximum value that we'll want to use is probably somewhere around Maybe 4,800, it's still got a little bit of warmth to it, which is quite nice. So we'll go to our range mapper here. We'll go to output upper, and instead of one, we'll change this to 4,800. And output lower, we'll change this to 1,000, I think. Let's just double check, we're happy with that. Uh, 1,000, that's 100. Let's go to 1100. Yeah, so 1000 will give us a red value. So now if we input into our range mapper and output into our result node, we can see instead of zero, we're outputting 1000. So perfect, that's set up properly. Now what we need to do is instead of going into our intensity, we need to change this to temperature. So again, we need to try and find this on the right node i think it's the fourth one down there temperature let's plug our range mapper into it and we will just make sure that that is working uh, we need to find our spherical field let's center it and you can see that that node is now graduating from red all the way to white through a load of orange colors so perfect, we've got that set up. What we also want to do is remap the intensity as this node 
sorry, as this field passes through all of our clones here. So let's say we want our maximum value to be, let's say, 3 and our lowest value to be 0 0.5. Well, we know we can do that in here. 3 on there, 0 0.5. Let's plug that in. Back into intensity. We can create another result node just to check it's all working. Yep, we've got a value of 3 and a value of 4,800 there. And then we can start moving it away. And we can see both of those values are starting to drop all the way down. So we can even change this even lower if we want to. Uh, let's try something like 0 0.2. And I think that's about right. So we've got the super dim value that we go all the way down to. Awesome. Cool. Now what we need to do is figure out how we're going to apply this to all of our clones. So we don't want to copy it one by one each time. So what we can do, take the tag, scroll all the way back up to our cloner, which will take a bit of a while depending on how many lights you have. <laughs> Drop it onto the cloner, right click and then do copy tag to children. We can now delete the one that's on the cloner and our spherical field is now having the exact effect that we were going for. So one thing I'm going to do here is just change this spherical field's fall off mode to curve. I'm going to take the inner offset all the way down to zero and then maybe just lower it slightly. And now we're getting a really nice fall off with a bright center tapering off into a really dim red color on the outside. So that pretty much wraps it up for this one guys. We're just back over in the original scene here because I wanted to show you that the rig that we created is actually identical to the one that I created for this scene. There is one small difference and just that the values in the range mapper are very slightly different. The lower value is uh, 1667 and the upper value is 4500. Other than that, all I've done is just add in this structure here and just drop in a redshift sun and sky rig. The values for that are just here if you do want to copy that setup. If I come out of this camera, you can see it's a very simple scene. The shadow is just coming in through this, this window, which is a photogrammetry model that I downloaded. Um, and that is, is all there is to it, really. So the main meat and potatoes of this scene really is the light rig that we've got on the ceiling. So if you want to get your hands on this rig and don't fancy building it all yourself, there is a download link to it on my website. One other thing I did want to point out, though, is inside these area lights, you have got access to everything that you have access to in a redshift light such as like under the details tab objects project whatever it might be so you can end up creating some really interesting effects if you you know link these values to your contribution so like diffuse reflection transmission so you can really use this to drive some really powerful effects so have some fun with it create something cool if you've got any other questions leave them in the comments below that's all there is from me remember to subscribe if you want to see some more videos like this in the future and hopefully i will see you in the next one